welcome to this session of the Center for the Economics of the Internet here at the Hudson Institute. My name is Harold Furch Scott Roth, and I'll be your host today. Uh, we are very pleased to have with us today Commissioner Brendan Carr from the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, Commissioner Carr uh, has served in many roles at the Commission before becoming a Commissioner. He served as General Counsel, as an advisor to uh, a Commissioner and in the staff, and now he is one of the commissioners at the FCC. He has taken on uh, a great many leadership roles at the commission, and we are very pleased to have you with us here at the center today. Um, you have become the point person on telehealth at the commission, and uh, could you tell us a bit about uh, what's going on at the commission on telehealth and uh, you know, the, the new proposal for a pilot project? Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Really appreciate uh, Hudson for hosting, and thank you for the, the invitation. Uh, really happy to talk about some of the work the FCC is doing in telehealth. And it might help to set the stage a little bit to talk about where the FCC has been really for a number of years on telehealth, which is an area we're going to continue to be, and this new pilot program, which is about a, a new trend in telehealth that we're looking to support as well. So historically, back to the uh, early 2000s, the FCC has played an important role in supporting telehealth. Principally, we've done that by helping to support, including subsidizing, the deployment of broadband to healthcare facilities, so to connected brick and mortar facilities. And in my time on the commission, I've been able to see some of the benefits of that type of deployment. I was in a small town, Beatty, Nevada. It's a population 1,010. It's about 90 miles outside of the, the Vegas Strip. It's a small town, obviously, and they had one healthcare clinic that was about to shut down because of the economics of having to serve such a rural, remote population. They got a new fiber broadband connection to the facility, and that changed the game in terms of being able to keep that facility open. So now what happens is you go to this facility, and you're welcomed by a nurse, Teresa, and she takes your blood pressure, uh, she takes your other vital signs, she walked us through the process, and then she uh, connects you remotely through the fiber connection to a doctor that's located in a much bigger city. And so that enables that community to continue to have quality care because of that uh, broadband, that telehealth connection to a broader facility. We've seen the same thing in other towns. We were in uh, Lenox, South Dakota. It's a, another small town, population 2,330. And it's a skilled nursing facility, and they're able to keep patients in that community and treat them there rather than having to do the long and sometimes difficult drive to large hospitals because again they have a broadband connection back to a larger facility so they have this um, among other things they have this cart with a camera uh, and all kinds of diagnostic tools they call it johnny five that they roll around and that enables them to uh, give high quality care right there and all of those are great uh, examples of the types of things that the fcc has been supporting in telehealth but what we're seeing is this new trend, which is when you're inside of these connected brick and mortar facilities, you have access to the highest of high quality care. But as soon as you walk outside that facility, your care can drop down to essentially zero. And with new advances in technology, that's changing. Whether it's your smartphone with mobile health applications uh, or a tablet, uh, there's all kinds of innovations now that you can take with you. We first heard about this um, Really, back in February, we were down in Jackson, Mississippi, with Senator Wicker, and we heard about this new remote patient monitoring program that was being deployed in the Mississippi Delta. And it was an example of this new trend that stuck with us. So about three weeks ago, we had the chance to go back to the Delta. Uh, the Delta is the northwest corner uh, of Mississippi. It's essentially between the, the Mississippi and the Yazoo River. It's uh, really known as the sort of poorest corner of what historically has been one of the poorest states in the country. And you see this clustering of issues, which is poor health outcomes in rural communities that often lack broadband access. And the Delta sees diabetes, for instance, at a rate about twice the national average. So what they happened in the Delta was they deployed a remote patient monitoring technology designed to address uh, the diabetes epidemic there. And diabetes, chronic diseases, diseases generally, is one area where remote patient monitoring technology can make a difference. So we met a woman there, Miss Annie, and she walked us through how it worked. 
For her, she said she woke up one morning with blurred vision, and that was the first sign that she had that she had diabetes. And she started going through the normal uh, in-person, in-facility treatment for diabetes and was seeing very little uh, change, very little results. So they put her in a remote patient monitoring tech project and she walked us through it. She was sent home with an iPad with a uh, glucometer, which is a Bluetooth enabled device. So you prick your finger, uh, you put your blood uh, right into this device and then it immediately uh, puts up your A1C level, which is an indicator of blood glucose right on the iPad. And she you know, knew how to do it and walked us through it. And right on that iPad in real time, it'll analyze your number, figure out if you're in range or out of range, and give you immediate feedback about steps you can take that day, whether it's eating or exercise, uh, to track and monitor and improve your outcomes. That one pilot project that she was in was 100 people in the Delta, and they saw significant cost savings in healthcare improvements. They saw a 1.7% reduction in A1C levels, which may not sound like a lot, but that's uh, known to be correlated even a 1% reduction in A1C with a 45% reduction in certain heart failure and cardiovascular issues. And they said that if just 20% of the diabetes population in Mississippi enrolled in that type of program, in terms of the savings, it would be a reduction in about $189 million uh, in Medicaid expenses. So that experiment, that pilot was really what got us thinking, this is a trend, this is something that we should support at the FCC. As active as we are with telehealth to the facility, let's stand up a new pilot program, which is what we'll be voting on this week, to help support those types of uh, remote patient monitoring technologies, that new trend in telehealth. Wow. <laughs> that sounds great. Sort of, sort of a long answer. I apologize for that. What? Uh, tell us more about your trip to Mississippi with Senator Wicker. What are some of the other things you saw outside of the, the Delta area? Yeah, we had a chance to do two trips there, uh, one to the southern part of the state, Jackson, and then one to the northern part. Uh, and Mississippi has really been a leader in these telehealth issues, uh, as Senator, Senator Wicker put it at the event we were at, because they have to be. There's about two thirds of the population is more than a 40 minute drive to specialty care. Uh, and so that's a big issue there. And finding ways to continue to support broadband deployment, because at the end of the day, you need that connectivity to make these remote patient monitoring technologies work. And from our perspective, places like New York and San Francisco, they're gonna get next generation connectivity. The people living there are gonna have access to technologies that can work. And that's why we're targeting this $100 million program to low income communities, because we think that obviously every community, every person uh, should get a fair shot at these new technologies that are coming online. I know you've also traveled uh, to the Great Plains, to um, Appalachia and the Shenandoah Valley. Can you tell us a bit about uh, those trips and the things you learned there? Yeah, one of the great benefits of uh, being in this job in DC is the chance to get outside of DC and see really firsthand how our policies uh, are impacting communities across the country. You mentioned, for instance, being in uh, the Shando Valley, went to a small town there, Woodstock, and we saw a new small cell uh, that was going up outside of a local high school. And as anyone following policy debates in the telecom space in DC knows, we're moving towards this new generation of connectivity called 5G. A big piece of 5G is gonna be the deployment of thousands of new small cells. One of the policy challenges that we face at the FCC, again, is how do we make sure that we see these small cell deployments everywhere? Not just on downtown areas, but also main streets, places like Woodstock. So we went and saw a small cell that had been deployed there outside of the high school. We talked to some of the kids there, uh, Isaac was one of them. He told us about the new uh, coding classes that the school is offering and how uh, this small cell, once it was deployed, had helped to add the capacity needed uh, to connect the tablets and other online learning that a lot of the kids are doing. You're sort of the point person on wireless infrastructure at the commission. Um, tell us about what's going on with wireless infrastructure. Yeah, so when you think about this movement towards 5G, again, it's a very different uh, product from an infrastructure perspective. On the one hand, you need these thousands of new small cells. So 3G and 4G deployments were generally marked by these large 200-foot uh, towers. A lot of people are familiar with that. We're still going to have those large towers, but 
increasingly, we're going to see, uh, in fact, upwards of 80% of all new deployments are going to be these small cells. So they're backpack size uh, antennas, essentially. And our regulatory structures, um, starting about a year ago, had assumed, uh, or being a year ago, it had been the case for, for many years, had been assuming that every new antenna is a 200-foot tower. So our regulatory structures uh, weren't ready to support this massive new deployment of small scale technologies. So we've been engaged uh, in a year long effort at the commission to get our regulatory structures, what we would call 5G ready. We did a big decision in March uh, this year. We essentially excluded all small cells from the federal review procedures that had applied to those large, what we call macro site towers. Uh, and that is expected to result in significant cost savings, upwards of 30% of the total cost of deploying a small cell have been going to these federal review procedures that were really geared towards those larger towers. So that's gonna make a big difference, particularly if you think about that 30%, you think about the communities that the private sector business case was, was on the edge. We can make it work, we can't make it work. We take 30% of the total cost of deployment, we think that can flip the business case for thousands of communities that we see 5G everywhere, which in my mind is, is the measure of success. Speaking of 5G, that's the topic that everyone's talking about these days. Uh, what do you see as the future of 5G? What is the FCC's role in all of that? Yeah, we're very excited about 5G. A lot of the, the cutting edge innovations that you read about and see right now 5G is really the upgrade to our networks, both wired and wireless, that we're going to need to enable all those new technologies. So take connected cars, for instance. We were in uh, the historic Willow Run Airport in uh, Ypsilanti, Michigan, and they've converted this old airport into a, uh, a test facility for connected cars. That's one of the innovations that 5G is going to help support. If you think about the roughly 40,000 highway deaths a year that we have and the possibility of connected cars driving that number down towards zero, it's a great innovation. And so we can't really afford to sit back and wait. We can't wait for a lot of reasons, but that's one of them. So as we race towards trying to get 5G deployed, the FCC has been focused on two things, obviously. Spectrum, you know, a lot more spectrum out there to enable these innovations. And we've got to make it easier to get the infrastructure out there, whether it's the small cells that are going up on utility poles or the backhaul and fiber and other connections needed to uh, bring high-speed connectivity to all those. And we're moving very quickly on both. On the spectrum side, uh, over the last year, the FCC has now put us in a position where we've allocated more spectrum than any other country in the world. We're about four gigahertz uh, ahead of China, which is in second place. And we're moving quickly now to bring that spectrum to market through a series of auctions, both at the end of this year and next year. And um, tell us about the auctions. What, uh, what do you see as the, the role of auctions in getting spectrum out? Is it a revenue source, or is it just to, to get uh, more spectrum out to the market to be used? Well, setting back auctions obviously has been one of the greatest innovations, I think, that the FCC has seen. Uh, for years, before we got auction authority, the commission would uh, dole out licenses through a variety of mechanisms. We would do lotteries uh, at some point. Uh, we would give spectrum away through either pioneer preferences or other mechanisms. And auctions really let the market decide uh, what's the highest and best use of this spectrum as opposed to us doing it. There's a bit of a sort of a micro debate, I think, that your, your question sort of tees up, which is, should we look at auctions as a revenue source for the federal government? We had one auction recently uh, that raised about $45 billion. Now, there's uh, a debate about, you know, how good is that $45 billion going into the treasurer versus potentially more money that stays um, in the private sector hands that can then be invested in network deployment. And those are two uh, big picture debates that we have to work through at the commission. What do you see as sort of the timelines on 5G deployment going forward? Yeah, we're seeing trials uh, of 5G right now. We're seeing small cells uh, increasingly going up, and there's going to be a blend between 4G, 4G, 4G advanced, and 5G. A lot of the standard setting process has been tied to the concept of getting that uh, across the finish line around 2020. So that's kind of been an anchor year that a lot of people are using for 5G. We're going to see some before that. We're going to see some after it, obviously. 
And how does 5G fit into telehealth? Uh, I assume this is going to create a lot of better opportunities for telehealth uh, with some of the expanded capabilities with 5G. That's right. We have a lot that we can do right now with existing networks, with existing 4G. We, we have seen a number of what I call remote patient monitoring trials and deployments, and they're functioning, obviously, on 4G in existing infrastructure. But 5G can enable even a new generation of telehealth, everything from remote surgery applications to other uh, really advanced uh, healthcare applications. And again, that's why with this pilot, we want to make sure and why we're targeting uh, low-income populations, essentially some of the same populations that are currently in our lifeline program at the commission, uh, because we want to make sure that as we move to 5G, as we see new healthcare opportunities rolled out, that those communities are also included in that new trend. You mentioned the pilot program. Uh, can you tell our audience a bit more about the pilot program and how you see that playing out? Sure. So this Thursday, we will uh, vote on it at the commission. Uh, it's what we call a notice of inquiry in regulatory speak, which is either step zero or step one in the regulatory process. And we tee up a number of questions. So we are the experts when it comes to networks in a lot of ways. We're not the experts uh, on the healthcare side, per se. So we ask a lot of questions about how we target this program. We throw uh, a lot of questions out there. We ask whether $100 million makes sense as the, the number that we should target for this. We're pretty clear about we want to make sure that there are objective metrics on the front end that can help test a number of theories. For instance, you know, is this driving down total healthcare costs? Is this improving patient outcomes? We have GAO style accountability on the front end of the project. And we ask about whether two to three years is the right timeline to run this pilot program. Are there other federal agencies that are involved in telehealth? There's, there's certainly a lot, and we've been uh, in touch and starting conversations with a lot of them. We spoke to Veterans Affairs. They have an office of telemedicine. The VA has really been one of the early adopters uh, when it comes to telemedicine, given uh, the aging population of veterans and a lot of the healthcare challenges there. Uh, CMS, Medicaid Services, is another uh, agency that we've been in touch with that we're looking to coordinate with going forward. And the VA has already seen really a lot of great success stories. They uh, had deployed telehealth to uh, qualifying patients, so patients that don't need uh, in-person care. And for those patients they deployed it to, they saw a 57% reduction in bed days at the VA, which can be a significant cost savings. And you might think that these technologies might be difficult for uh, certain populations to pick up and learn, but that hasn't been the case that we've been seeing. They, they're pretty user-friendly. Again, Miss Annie in the Mississippi Delta, you know, she was able to walk us through this. Uh, the VA has an example. Uh, there's a Sergeant Major George Howell is one of the examples they use. He was a 30-year, uh, had a 30-year career in the military, including serving in the 101st Airborne Division. He was a machine gunner, was a Vietnam veteran, and he has been sent home with uh, one of these remote patient monitoring technologies for a number of conditions, hypertension, gout, a couple others. And he checks in daily, and his nurse, who's located at a facility, can see his numbers on a daily basis that he's inputting. And the nurse noticed that his glucose level was fluctuating a lot. And so she was able to see that online remotely and was able to then have a conversation with him and essentially give him a new diet, a new uh, uh, schedule for his meals. And just that sort of light one touch from a distance was able to change his numbers. He ended up losing 40 pounds and seeing a lot of improved results. So there's a lot of care that doesn't require an in-person visit. There's some that always will, but there's a lot that doesn't. And if we can treat that remotely through technology rather than coming to what is essentially the biggest cost center in the healthcare system, which is an emergency room visit, we can address these things before it gets to that stage. Uh, we see a lot of reduced uh, costs and improved patient outcomes. So it sounds like a lot of this is focused on um, outside of the facility care. And um, I understand next week you're going to be going to Alaska. Is that right? Can you tell us a bit about that trip? And will yeah. telehealth be part of that as well? Yeah, we're looking forward to it. It's a rite of passage for all new FCC commissioners, as you would know, uh, to spend some time uh, up in Alaska. And we're really looking forward uh, to that. We'll be with Senator Sullivan up there next week. 
Uh, we'll be in Anchorage. We'll be spending a day out uh, in Dutch Harbor, which is out on the Aleutian Islands. We'll be heading up to Barrow, Alaska, which is the northernmost uh, town in Alaska. I think the statistic is it's north of about 98% of the world's landmass, so pretty far up there. And as part of that, we're going to see a lot of uh, the use of telehealth in various communities, which obviously, given the difficulties and the distances with getting to healthcare centers, that's another place where telehealth can make a difference. And actually, Alaska has been a place that's benefited a lot from our existing healthcare programs, which have been focused on getting broadband to healthcare facilities. One of the uh, things that the commission has done in the past uh, years, uh, variously called restoring internet freedom, or sometimes network neutrality. Uh, how is that all playing out? Can you tell us a bit about uh, restoring, uh, restoring internet freedom at, uh, at the FCC and, and where you see that going? Yeah, net neutrality, I think, is, is a great topic that, that I always welcome a chance to, to get to talk about. It's an issue that obviously Americans, uh, regardless of their political stripe, feel passionately about. We all have our own experience with the internet and what access to online information has meant for our lives, for our economy, for our education, and nobody wants to see that disrupted. I think what we've seen over the years is there's a really set of common core principles that there's really not a lot of debate about. People don't want to get blocked when they go to their websites. Uh, there's some basic rules of the road that there's very little controversy about in my mind. What we faced at the FCC, obviously, was a, a legal question about is Title II legally the right fit as a definitional matter for the internet. We addressed that question. Uh, we reversed, obviously, the 2015 FCC decision. And that decision has now been in effect for 40 or 50 days. And we saw a lot of really extreme rhetoric around this issue. Uh, I think some of that's part and parcel of just the political dynamics in DC right now. There's a lot of people that were fanning these false flames of fear that as soon as this decision was going to go into effect, it was the end of the internet or the end of the internet as we know it. We're now, again, 40 or 50 days uh, into the same regulatory regime we had for the first six years of the Obama administration. Obviously, the internet is continuing to function. It's continuing to flourish. In fact, what we're seeing is a new, uh, an, an increase even in investment in this space. What we saw on the record was that Title II was leading to a decrease in investment in network infrastructure at a point in time when we need the exact opposite of that. We need more broadband deployed for more Americans. And I think that's what the data that's coming in is already showing. Another, another hot topic today is, is privacy and uh, uh, some of the issues surrounding the use of customer information. Does the FCC have a role in that? Uh, other federal agencies, where, where does the FCC fit in? Yeah, we do, we do have an important role. This was another um, issue that arose out of the Title II debate. In 2015, when the FCC classified the internet as a Title II service for the first time, what that did was it stripped the authority of the Federal Trade Commission, which is our nation's premier consumer protection agency, of 100% of its authority with respect to the privacy practices of broadband providers, created essentially a donut hole. Now, the FC tried uh, to fill that hole uh, a couple months later through its own authorities. But what we did by reversing Title II is we restored the authority of the Federal Trade Commission. And so they can now look at the entire internet ecosystem, whether it's an edge provider that has your data or a broadband provider that has your data. They can look at the whole ecosystem uh, and apply the law uh, evenly to any provider's use of your data. But going forward, we still have a role at the FCC. We have a memorandum of understanding, for instance, uh, that's been executed with the Federal Trade Commission so we can work together on these issues. As a former general counsel of the FCC, do you have a different perspective on how the agency operates, how, um, how it fits in with various statutory and regulatory provisions than someone like me who wasn't general counsel before coming to commission? It's a good question. So one of the great things about uh, telecom, about the FCC, is there's a lot of different sort of hats you can wear in this space. And I think to some extent, as a commissioner, you really have to wear all of them. So I'm not the economist, but I would hope that 
uh, the decisions I reach are at least informed by people that know more than me about uh, those types of issues. And the same thing with the law. You know, that's a core part of my regulatory philosophy is we got to respect uh, the authority given to us by Congress and the limits that Congress placed on that authority. And so I think that does inform uh, the job that you do as a commissioner. And what do you see? Do you, do you think the statute should be changed, or is that something that you think a commissioner shouldn't have a view about? <laughs> it feels like a leading question. I think I'm supposed to say, yeah, I shouldn't have a view on that. Uh, no, no, I don't. Well, wasn't, wasn't. I'll say this. Obviously, we, we defer to sort of Congress's good judgment on um, what they want us to do and whether to update or amend the Communications Act. I certainly think, you know, as technology progresses, it's incumbent on all of us, whether regulator or lawmaker, to make sure that our regulatory structures reflect the, uh, the modern trends in technology. A lot of that we do have authority to address. And for instance, on the infrastructure side, it's not, the game is no longer solely about 200 foot towers, but we have the ability to update our regulations to account for this new, relatively new development of small cells. So there's a lot that we can do within the authority we've been given by Congress uh, to update and modernize our approach. But it always makes sense if Congress were to step in to either codify some of the updates or changes that we've done uh, or take a look more generally at the statute. I could go on and on, but I would don't think I should monopolize the questions here. We have a wonderful audience. I think some of them are eager to ask you some questions, and I have sure. a bunch more to ask as well. Uh, we, will, we have microphones around the room, and uh, when you ask a question, please identify yourself uh, for the rest of the audience. And for our online audience, uh, should we be uh, hashtag Hudson Events uh, for our online question? Hashtag Hudson Events, uh, and for all of our reporters who are online, please uh, send your questions in as well. So uh, the lady here. I'm Ellen Milheiser. I write a newsletter on defense and veterans health care called Synopsis. Um, you're focused on re remote patient monitoring, but um, DOD uses telehealth from the battlefront backwards with MedHub, and the VA uses a lot of telehealth without remote patient monitoring. They do behavioral health and dermatology and all of that. What efforts are y'all doing to help with those kinds of you know, telehealth? It's a great question. So what we have right now at the commission is a $547 million a year program. Uh, uh, we call it the RHCs. It's essentially our health care program. That's designed to help support broadband deployments to brick and mortar facilities. So essentially the, the policy goal there is how do we make sure that uh, a rural or remote clinic is paying the same thing for their broadband connection that a healthcare facility would pay uh, at a larger city. So there's a lot of funding that we do. Uh, a big portion of that funding actually goes to Alaska right now with given the challenges that they have. That program is, is gonna continue. In fact, uh, about three months ago, this FCC significantly increased the funding, the annual funding that's going to that program. Separately, we also have a, a broader universal service program, which is a $10 billion a year fund that we disperse uh, through different programs, that healthcare program being one of them, which is designed to get more broadband deployed. So the idea is that while we are going to continue our efforts to get more broadband to these facilities, the idea with this pilot program is we're seeing this new trend that's in this new space of direct to the patient, remote patient monitoring technologies. So let's launch a one-time $100 million program to investigate whether that's something that we should be supporting and helping to get across the finish line. So we're very focused on that, that that big picture point that you talked about, and this pilot program is about, let's also support this new trend. Uh, Mr. Hershey here in front. Bob Hershey, I'm a consultant. Uh, what will the new technologies uh, let you do uh, better in uh, providing the service? Yeah, it's a great question. So we were down at, uh, Charlottesville. UVA has a office of telemedicine down there, and they walked us through a lot of their new technology. So you can take home kits now that you'll have. Obviously, your iPad can be a piece of it, but you can get uh, weight, you can get temperature, pulse, um, oxygen levels, blood oxygen levels. 
So there's a lot of clinical specialties with just a few of these uh, connected devices you take home with you that can be treated. Chronic disease management is a big piece of it. Uh, diabetes, COPD, but there's over 60 clinical specialties that can benefit and use remote patient monitoring. Everything from uh, opioid dependency, you can do a remote visit with a pain specialist uh, to heart conditions. So it's, in a lot of ways, it's not just taking the care that you would get in a facility with you everywhere. It's also, because you're monitoring in real time, you're able to actually see more and do more than you might on an inpatient visit. So there's a lot that can be done with that. Right now, if you look at the, for instance, Medicaid, uh, of the total outlay, total spending by Medicaid, support for remote patient monitoring accounts for about zero point and then four zeros in a three. So it's a small percent of the outlay right now. And the idea is, are we nearing a tipping point where whether it's Medicaid or the VA, there's this trend uh, and that those costs there can be picked up. And the VA is another good example. They have the ability to pay for the care, the doctors on the doctor end of the remote patient monitoring. They have the ability to pay for the tablets, the, tech, the devices themselves that patients take home but they have limits in terms of their ability to fund the broadband connection to make that device work. That's one example of where the FCC partnering up with this program could be a perfect match. Uh, obviously, it's the shortest putt for us is to fund the broadband connection to that device. So that might be an example where we can work together to stand up more of these programs. Lady in the back. Hi, my name's Kayla from ONDCP. And I have a question about what you said about um, opioids. So could you talk about uh, telemedicine with the opioid epidemic and what you've been seeing when you've been traveling across the country? And also, what are you doing with the pilot program when you ask these questions on Thursday? Are you gonna bring up the opioid epidemic and how that relates to veterans in rural areas? Yeah, it's a great question. The, the potential use of this for opioids is something that's right on the first page of our notice of inquiry, which shows that it's at the forefront of our mind at the FCC. I've met with two types of specialists that uh, address the opioid epidemic through remote patient monitoring. One are pain management specialists, and the other are psychologists. And part of it is uh, getting the information to the healthcare professionals in remote uh, communities about the different options for treating pain. There's a, a time and a place for opioids. Uh, and there's a time and a place where you should be doing something other than opioids. So there's an educational side to the remote um, role providers, the same on the patient side. So you can be providing information, you can be having essentially secure FaceTime uh, uh, sessions with a psychologist, which can also help. You have remote sessions, video sessions with a pain management specialist that can walk you through different options. There's also the ability to address whether there is a uh, drug you should be pres prescribed to help address opioid dependency. Now, there's some challenges. There's licensing challenges. Uh, for instance, uh, you have to have an in-person visit uh, generally to get an opioid um, prescribed to you. And some of the drugs that are used to help uh, pull people off of their opioid dependency have a small amount of opioid in it as well. And so to some extent, you then have to have an in-person in visit as well to get that treatment. So there's some challenges uh, with aligning, whether it's reimbursement or licensing issues with remote patient monitoring, that we at the FCC can't solve all of it, uh, but we wanted to put our hat in the ring to help support this general movement and see how we can uh, help shed light on this. Commissioner, how does it work today when you're visiting uh, the Delta region of uh, Mississippi or other parts of the country, if, uh, if I'm a, uh, if I live in a low-income household, I, I need some telehealth support, I go to a clinic, I get something, and then I go home, and what if I don't have a broadband connection there? Is, that a, is there an FCC program for that today, or is that something that this new pilot program would be looking at uh, helping to fund? Yeah, some of our existing programs might be able to help there, but that is something that we had teed up in this particular pilot program. For instance, we asked questions about whether uh, we should be looking closely at facilities-based providers, so that potentially some of the money could be used to put up a new cell tower uh, where a community doesn't have service. Those are some of the questions that we're gonna be uh, asking in the NOI. But if there is a cell tower, if there's service available, but I just can't afford it today, uh, 
is does the FCC have a program for that? That is uh, the idea of this $100 million NOI. So the pilot that we saw, for instance, in the Mississippi Delta, the local wireless provider, C Spire, donated the wireless connectivity. There was an existing tower, which we went and saw, that provided coverage to the area, and they donated the cost of the connectivity, which is great. You may not be uh, in a position, or a carrier may not be able to, uh, to be in a position to do that everywhere. And that's part of what we're asking about is should this $100 million uh, go for that connectivity piece so that the, the tablet they've been provided actually works. Thanks. Dr. Chappelle Letta from Harris Wilcher and Granis. And uh, perhaps the commissioner can explain who actually pays into the Universal Service Fund out of which the rural health care and other programs low because as Commissioner Perchcott Roth can remember in the early days of the fund, you know, it was a, a few percentage points that traditional telephone carriers paid into the fund. And over the years, over the 20 odd years since the Telecommunications Act of 96, as you mentioned, the fund's grown into a pretty large fund and now the con contribution percentage, contribution, that's what we say, you know, in the, uh, hmm. in the world of tax lawyers, might call it a tax, but uh, has grown up to about 20 percent. and. Right. And consequently, you've also seen a lot of new entrants into the field, you know, devise their services in a way, in, in, you know, in, in particular technology to evade paying into that fund. So perhaps you could, well, one, explain who pays in and also what the FCC might be doing to try to remove uh, incentives to not pay into the fund, given, you know, that it is now about a 20 percent tax on one's revenues. Yeah, it's a great question. So the Universal Service Program, as we talked about, is about a $10 billion a year fund right now. Uh, who pays into that fund is essentially traditional uh, telephone subscribers. So you will have a line item on your bill. As you noted, it's about 20% uh, of a subset of your charges right now, uh, which goes into the Universal Service Fund. We've been seeing some reductions in the drawdowns on particular programs. I think Lifeline, for instance, uh, is a program that has seen something in the order of $300 million less in expenditures uh, over the last, on, a, on an annual basis over the last couple of years. And so the idea with this program is it's sort of similar to Lifeline in the sense of targeting uh, low-income populations. And so it'd be a new uh, $100 million uh, fund uh, that would be part of the Universal Service Program. And to your point, there's a, been a long-term debate at the FCC, uh, both on the, the sort of the distribution side and on the contribution side about whether the FCC should engage in some fundamental reforms. One of them is, um, does it continue to make sense to apply the contribution side uh, burden on the telephone subscriber base? Does it make sense to apply it to other users? I mean, that's a whole uh, pretty broad debate that the FCC has had in front of it for a number of years. Gentlemen back. Um, Carlos Avillon, uh, Bank of um, Central American Economic Integration. Um, I was wondering, what's the status of um, telemedicine with respect to um, surgery robots, to um, um, diagnosing through robots? Like IBM has this um, wonderful supercomputer, Watson for oncology. Mm. And uh, intuitive technologies in California has this great robot for surgery in multiple areas. And um, there's a lot of new surgery robots coming into the market right now. And I was wondering where where is the status right now, long distance uh, surgery? Is, is yeah. it happening? Are you considering it? It's a great question. It's something that is uh, in the future, I would say. We were down in New Orleans a couple weeks ago at Oxner uh, Healthcare Facility, and they showed us some of the robotic technology that they're working on right now. But right now, it's pretty much limited to being in the next room uh, because you want to be able to, right now at least, get more of the technology is have a doctor that is physically present that can step in uh, should anything go wrong. I mean, obviously, you're doing a routine procedure, but as today, doing a routine procedure, you never really know what happens, and it could move into an area uh, where you need an in-person 
doctor right now. So we are looking in terms of the future of healthcare, potentially going to remote surgery and 5G will help in the sense of getting our networks to a point where uh, we call it latency, which is the delay. Obviously you can't have a lot of delay between either the video or the doctor uh, making a movement remotely that uh, then impacts the robot essentially doing the surgery. So that's an idea in the future. 5G as a network upgrade will help enable it, but we're still a ways away, uh, I think, to bring it into reality. Uh, Commissioner, don't we have today, uh, there's, there's one band that's essentially for medical devices or is heavily used for that. Is that, is that the same as the 5G or is 5G different for, for longer distances? Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit different. So when I think of 5G, we've been focused a lot at the FCC on what we call millimeter wave spectrum, which is very uh, high band spectrum. But 5G ultimately as a technology is gonna be pushed down through all the spectrum bands. So mid band spectrum and then low band, low band spectrum being what traditionally historically has been used for mobile cellular. So we're seeing a lot of the, the first 5G plays up in this millimeter wave spectrum but we're ultimately going to have the technology, uh, hopefully through all the spectrum bands. Lady here. Um, so going back to the topic of net neutrality um, and those surgeries in particular, what is the position of the FCC when it comes to access and the fact that if there's a um, discrimination against um, a certain person, then there couldn't be, or not a person, but like, um, like the network needs to be fully efficient for the surgery to be successful. So are there any regulations that are gonna come into place for this? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think there's this view that by reversing the Title II style net neutrality rules that the FCC had, that we've created a uh, sort of a, a wild west version of the internet where no holds are barred, that there's no regulation, that you are simply at the whims of your broadband provider. And that's not the reality. So what we did by reversing Title II is we restored the authority of the Federal Trade Commission. And the Federal Trade Commission has a number of sources of authority so that if a broadband provider were to engage in a lot of the anti-competitive conduct that people are concerned about when they raise net neutrality concerns, uh, there is the Sherman Act and there's other uh, FTC-based enforcement actions that can come in to make sure that we're not seeing uh, anti-competitive conduct in this space. Commissioner, does the commission receive lots of complaints about anti I see a lot of complaints about a lot of things, yeah. <laughs> Rightly so, a lot, a lot of times. Good answer. <laughs> no, uh, specifically about uh, this form of discriminatory conduct uh, uh, by internet providers. Does the commission receive a lot of complaints about that? So during the Title II uh, era, while it was in place, we did receive a number of complaints uh, even during that uh, time. And we also received, as we were going through our net neutrality proceeding, something on the order of 20 plus million comments addressing various issues. And the status quo right now is that by having uh, reversed the Title II decision, the Federal Trade Commission, which again is sort of our premier consumer protection agency, is finally once again empowered. So they do see complaints that are violations of uh, FTC law, they'll be able to step in and take action. And we've also, uh, as I mentioned, have entered into a memorandum of understanding so we can also bring our expertise to bear uh, in these situations. Gentleman here. Hi, I'm Jonathan Walker. I'm with the Health Management Academy. Um, so how have efforts with, at the uh, FCC been aligned with um, the movement towards value-based care and healthcare? And has there been much coordination with agencies like CMS? And what are some of the implications you've seen in value-based care, particularly with population health or emergency usage um, of those types of services? Yeah, thanks. So we have been in touch uh, with CMS. We've been in touch uh, with the VA as well. Uh, we're familiar with this trend, uh, or at least this discussion of moving towards value-based care. It's not uh, within our bailiwick to sort of opine on whether that's good or bad. Again, we're sort of the, the network side people, but we're aware of that discussion and we're aware that a lot of people talk about telehealth and remote patient monitoring in particular as a development that can support this movement 
uh, towards value-based care, but I haven't done enough of my own research to, to sort of fully understand that issue and to weigh in on it. And the lady here. Hi, I'm Olivia Boyce with Insight Telepsychiatry, um, and we offer mental health care um, across the nation to a number of different populations. Um, one of the ones that we've seen a lot of need um, and very little kind of, or, or lots of problems with connectivity has been in kind of tribal nations. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious if that's a population that would be targeted by some of these programs. Yeah, thanks, I would hope so. The state of broadband deployment on tribal nations uh, is far, below acceptable standards when you look at the statistics. As a country, uh, we have done pretty well when it comes to broadband deployment, uh, particularly given our sparse and rural population densities. But there are still areas where we need to make progress. Uh, deployment on tribal lands is one of them. Uh, that's why I think either my first or one of my very first votes uh, as a commissioner had to do with a universal service program and some changes there that would free up uh, more support for deployments on tribal lands. And a week ago, we actually met with a group of uh, tribal broadband providers, uh, and they were talking about how they were uh, grateful for that change the FCC did, and how that's enabling them to do some additional deployments. We're certainly not across the finish line. We're not where we need to be, but it is something that uh, is on our radar, is looking to ways to continue to support broadband deployment in tribal areas, and this program would be open for deployments there. Oh, this is a good question. <clears throat> and this will be our last one, and then we'll let the commissioner get back to the back to his. Okay, so it's not another question. I just wanted to pick up on the question that the young lady asked about um, net neutrality and, and, and in the uh, application of remote surgery. And, and frankly, I mean, one of the uh, features in 5G is uh, called network uh, slicing, and the notion is you could actually dedicate a higher quality, more robust, more secure. Uh, channel to a particular application like remote surgery. And, and there was concern by telecom lawyers, and I sense most of you are telehealth people, and that's good, uh, that you know, with Title II, providers might not be able to uh, actually you know, provide you know, what's called paid prioritization or, or a better channel for particular applications. And I personally would want a better, more robust, more secure channel for remote surgery than for my kids' Instagram photos. So I think in, in one area that, that is you know, the, the reversion back to, you know, Title I or, or, or handing it over to FTC actually, I think, clears up uh, the, the path for some of these applications for telehealth, and, and, and providers are probably going to better invest in that now. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for that clarification. Not to denigrate the quality of your kids' uh, Instagram no, posts. They're, they're, they're high quality. Well, please join me in thanking the commissioner for all of his wonderful comments today.